Thank you for the, uh, uh, the organizers to invite me here today. The last time I spoke at this conference, I was on the screen from the UK. It was midnight, it was pelting down with rain, and now I'm here. And I realize just how wonderful it is. So thank you very much indeed. And it's such a privilege to be able to speak to you personally. So what I'm going to do over the next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so is I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a passion of mine, which is tackling food waste. I think, it's, I think it's one of the most important things we're going to do over the next 20 years, building on what Albert has just said. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about RAP, then I'm going to tell you why I think it's so important for us to tackle food waste. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the, the case for change, the economic case, the case for change, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the experiences that we've had, both in prevention and recycling. And I do hope this gives you something that's useful in your journey in reducing food waste here, because I'm delighted to hear, as I, as I landed, that you've committed in Australia to halving food waste by 2030, which is astonishing, because there's relatively few countries around the world that are even on this pathway. So, great, just a little bit about RAP. Uh, we ha we're a charity, we're a not-for-profit organization, and we have a goal, which is a world in which resources are used sustainably. So a really big challenge, huge challenge, and we're focusing particular areas, food, clothing, uh, textiles, and electricals, underpinned by trying to make that drive to what Albert was talking about, that zero-waste economy, yeah, getting more and more materials into productive use. And what we like to do is we like to work at the interface between governments, between businesses, manufacturers, retailers, and indeed with consumers. So for example, we run voluntary agreements where we sit in the middle between those and help drive change towards common goals. And also we run consumer campaigns like Love Food, Hate Waste, which I'm delighted to see is also being used here in Australia. And it's lovely that some of you in this room are actually working with us in this particular area. How do we do it? Well, again, building on what Albert said, it's about a systematic approach. It's about trying to reinvent the way we design and produce things so you use less materials to produce it and less waste during the, the production process, working with us as people to reduce the amount of waste we all produce through campaigning in particularly, and then to make the best use of the materials that do end up at the first line. So, for example, in food waste terms, can we capture food waste, unavoidable food waste, inedible food waste, put it back through composting and early digestion, and use it as a renewable fertilizer to grow more crops and close that loop, and in the process perhaps generate some renewable energy just to get it even better in that process. And just to give you an idea of the sort of impact that we've had, you know, one of our voluntary agreements that you'll hear some more about, the Courtauld commitment, in three years in its phase two, saved 1.7 million tonnes worth of waste in total. And if you filled a refuse truck, and actually laid it end to end, it would fill 1, uh, 184,500 trucks, which actually would stretch from Edinburgh to Geneva, which, let me tell you, in European terms, is a hell of a long way. Okay, in Australian terms, it's next door, but even so, it's a hell of a long way, I promise you. So our ambition, yes, we're a champion 12.3. We are trying to help the world move towards halving food waste, um, and we're working with other countries and other companies um, around the world to do that. We want to build more resilient supply chains. And as Tim said, we're also beginning to think about how we might link this work and actually help people eat more healthy and sustainably in the future. OK, so why? Why, why am I so passionate about food waste? Why is it really important to talk about it? Well, I think this is the big picture. You know, by 2050, there's going to be another 2.5 billion people on this planet. That was the world population in 1950. And we've got to find housing for them. We've got to find transport. We've got to find food for them. We've, yeah, we've got to find water for them. What is this implication going to have? Well, you know, it means that by 2030, 50% more energy. By 2030, 50% more food because we're getting more and more Western diets. Whereas economies are becoming more, uh, more Westernized, they're adopting more Western-style diets. More water is going to be used, 30% more by 2030. In the UK, we're increasingly getting food from countries that are actually drought prone, and that's going to get worse. And we're going to do that against a backdrop of having to mitigate against climate change. So if we actually feed the world population in 2050 using the carbon intensity of the food system now, that will generate enough climate, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to raise the temperature by two degrees C of the whole planet. So all we'll be able to do is feed people. 
if we want to stay within the two, two degree uh, limit. Now that's clearly not tenable. We're going to have to do things differently. And one of the key things we have to do is address the 1.3 billion tons worth of food every year that we chuck away. That's a third of the total amount of food produced on the planet. That takes the area the size of China to grow every year. That's the scale of the food waste challenge. And it's costing us a fortune. It's costing 1,240 billion Australian dollars, which is more than twice the turnover of the world's biggest retailer, Walmart. In environmental terms, it's actually the third biggest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet. It's six times aviation emissions. It's huge. And that's against a backdrop of one in nine going to bed every night hungry. So clearly, we can do different, we can do better. And what's also interesting, when you look at the food waste around the world, what you see is in developing countries, the food waste is in the supply chain, but in developed economies uh, like Australia, like the UK, uh, like most of Europe, you're actually seeing more and more of the food waste in the home. And actually, as countries are making the transition to developing nations, developed nations, there you're seeing less waste in the supply chain, more waste in the home. And that does seem to be repeated around the world, which is extraordinary. So just to give you an example, post-farm gate in the UK, you can see the dominance of household food waste, 7.3 million tons out of the 10 that's there. Okay, there's another 3 million, roughly speaking, maybe two, pre-farm gate, that's the number we're working on at the moment. But bottom line is, household is a major part of this issue. And of course, now we've got some drivers for change. We've got the UN Sustainable Development Goals, of which 12, Sustainable Consumption, has 12.3, which is halving food waste, to land, uh, halving food waste full stop. But also, if we tackle that, that helps us with no hunger, it helps us with good health, it helps us with no poverty, it helps us with life below water, it helps us with life on land, it helps us with sustainable cities, it actually helps right across the piece. So I think tackling food waste is absolutely key. And interestingly, the European Commission is thinking along the same lines, because they're bringing in, in the circular economy package, if it's approved, mandatory measurement of food waste across all of the EU, separate collection of food waste, and a target of 50% reduction, either mandatory or voluntary, not too sure just yet, but that would make a big change to the whole issues. Oh, that's a worry when you press end it. That's it, great. Okay, so I'll just go back. So that's, the, I think, the compelling social and environmental reason. But what about the business case? How does the business case stack up? Now, one of the things we did with the World Resources Institute, we published a report back in March which looked at the business case. And what we did is we looked to see if we could find companies who have... Uh, reduced uh, food waste, how much it cost them to reduce it, and how much return they got from that investment. And we found data on 1,200 sites, six of which were in Australia, from 200 companies in 17 countries. And what was astonishing is that 99% of all of that work, 99% paid back more than the investment. But what was really interesting is that 50% of the countries got $14 back for every $1 expended, or better, which is simply extraordinary. For every $1 expended, half the companies got at least $14 back, a simply extraordinary number. We were absolutely shocked by it. But when you look at the numbers, okay, it dominates between one and five, so that's 500% return on your investment. That's where the biggest numbers were, but you can see this huge tail going right the way through where you think, crikey, there's some fantastic return on investment. Why is that happening? I think it's down to this explanation. Because people look at food waste, and when they think of the cost of food waste, they think it's actually the cost of disposal. Because that, that's the bill they get. That's the bill that comes in that they pay. Okay, so it's how much it cost me to put in landfill, how much it cost me to get it recycled. Actually, the true cost of food waste is everything below the line. It's the lost materials, it's the energy costs, it's the lost labour, it's the water costs, all of that stuff. That's about ten times the value of the disposal costs. And that's the reason I think people were really underestimating the return on investments they were getting and also not focusing on food waste as a real opportunity for change. So if I summarise the economic case, it does save money, it does drive efficiency, the results are astonishing. If we do this, it will build more resilient supply chains. And also, obviously, reducing food waste in the home helps us all in this room reduce the cost of waste disposal from collection processes. So less cost for the public sector. Interestingly, though, we've also looked at the impact in the home when consumers in the UK reduce food waste, 
they spend some of that money on better quality food, reinvesting about half of it in better quality food. So there's even a business case for retailers and food manufacturers to help people make the best use of the food that they buy. Okay, so how might we go about reducing this? We've had some experience of doing this, and one of the things that's come out of this experience, we've been working on this for about 10 years, the key thing is look at it across the supply chain. And this slide hope illustrates this. This is a supply chain for one hotel in the north of England. I have to say, I don't think this is a very good supply chain. As I go through it, you'll be, surpri you'll be surprised at the numbers. But what this tells you is by doing the analysis, you can work out where to act. So out of 100 potatoes, two were lost in the field. Nine were lost in grading. They didn't make the grade. They went off to animal feed. Three were lost in storage. 17 were lost in packaging and transportation. Potatoes are easy to damage, but this was clearly one where they needed some more work in that space. Nine were spoiled in the kitchen. So this is coming into the hotel. 20 were lost in preparation because a hell of a lot of them were chipped. So you lost the, you lost the skins. 15 were left on the plate. 25 got eaten. Now, when you look at that, you say, well, OK, don't worry about the numbers. The key thing is it's the analysis. The analysis shows you where you can act. And it also shows that if you're going to tackle food waste, you need to take this systematic approach going right across the supply chain in the process. So that's what we've done with our voluntary agreements. That's what Courtauld is about, looking right across the supply chain, working with all of the major retailers, 95% market share of the retailers, all the major food manufacturers, developing and promoting best practices to act right across the supply chain. And in the last three years, that agreement saved 170 million Australian dollars for the signatories in that process. So this collaboration really can work. We've also taken this to the hospitality and food service sector. And there we set a target of 5% reduction in food waste for all the signatories to work in this particular space. And in three years, amazingly, they delivered 11%. That was 24,000 tonnes of food prevented and a £67 million worth of saving. And also, we saw this big increase in food distribution as well, 1.5 million extra meals distributed as part of that process. Again, showing collaboration works. But what about the home? You saw those numbers. The home really is important. If we can get change there, behavioural change there, then we can really make a difference. And this is where Love Food Hate Waste has come in, through raising awareness of the issue, influencing consumer habits and changing the retail environment. So that's the key strategy, doing those three things. Raising awareness, I have to say, has gone really, really well. That's been one of the, the success stories. You know, we've gone from a position now when, when you actually talk to customers in store, supermarkets get their um, uh, feedback and they say that either one, number one or number two environmental concern for UK citizens is food waste. So that's gone from being virtually nowhere 10 years ago. So that's tremendous. The question is, how are we turning that into action? Well, where we're focusing is on planning behaviours, you know, buy what you need, uh, storage behaviours, storing fresh fruit and vegetables in, inside your fridge means they'll last weeks longer than if you leave them outside. Love your leftovers, because that's a tremendous way of, um, uh, of enjoying your food and getting your portions right in the first place. There have been the focuses, and I have to say where we've had most success is on leftovers, encouraging people to use leftovers and getting, because that's an easy thing for us to do. Buying the right amount is quite tough, but we've made some progress there, but that's the area we've made the biggest progress. But also, to help make this happen, we need to change what happens in store. And so we need to extend shelf life. We need to bring in innovative packing, like resealable packs, like the, pack, the split pack you can see there, where you've got two pieces of chicken actually alongside each other, so one can go in the freezer or in the fridge, and the other one can be used. It helps you manage your food. It's about labelling on the back of pack with simple hints. Um, for example, on salad packs, um, about around 50% of all salad packs are thrown away. So if you have the message on the back, love food, hate waste, about how you can make the best use of your salad bags, that can really help. And also, can you, can you actually change the promotions? We used to have buy one, get one freeze on perishable items. Well, that was quite difficult to use. So we've encouraged retailers to move to actually, you know, reduction in costs, different types of promotions, you know, 10%, 20% off, or special deals on saying having a number of different fruits. That's worked extremely well. We've seen that we've virtually got away from buy one, get one free. And better labeling. You know, you can freeze up to the use by date on products. Put that on pack. You know, how, where to keep them best. All of those changes have happened. So what's been the impact of that approach? Well, this is Wembley Stadium. Some of you may recognise this. 90,000 people will sit here and enjoy some football and even some rugby when they're really inspired. 
And the key thing is, what we've helped to do in the UK is reduce the amount of food waste in the home by a million tonnes a year. That will fill Wembley Stadium to the brim every single year. So that's, a, that's equivalent to 4 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions and a saving of about 3.4 billion Australian dollars to the citizens of the UK. So this can work. What also we have to do is to drive recycling, though. It's not just about, uh, uh, about prevention, although prevention is absolutely key. What did we do there? Well, what we did is we looked across Europe at best practice on, on and how to drive up food waste recycling, and we found that the high recycling rates are associated with food waste collection. What we did, though, find is also it's very patchy across Europe, and there are lots of different methods that were employed. The methods that worked best were the ones then we encouraged in the UK, which is weekly collection separately of food against a backdrop of uh, trying to re restrict residual waste, um, either by going for fortnightly collection, for example, or reducing the amount, coupled with a comprehensive recycling infrastructure for dry recyclables. And what was interesting is by doing that, we've increased recycling. We, as, as the UK has increased recycling dramatically right across the piece. And now we've gone from being one of the worst recyclers in Europe to one of the best. And the star has been Wales, that, that line there, where we work very closely with the Welsh government. They're over 55%. They're getting close to 60 of the latest numbers that have come out. Now, what happened in Wales? Why was that so successful? And again, the encouragement here was food waste only collections for everybody in Wales largely on a weekly basis, largely with a liner. Now, what you've actually seen on this graph is you see that actually by the process of going down through moving towards fortnightly collections, you've seen a constriction and a reduction in residual waste. That's prevention and more recycling. And you've seen a growth in recycling, particularly in food, uh, but also in other recyclables across the process. So you that double whammy. You have prevention and you've encouraged a move towards more recycling. That means you get much better recycling rates. And the conclusions of that is, if you want to deliver high recycling rates, you need to collect food waste. That's great because that faces us all with the consequences of our behavior. So maybe that will also help us in prevention. Separate food waste collections with restricted capacity is also key. And, getting, and being a really good service, like kitchen caddies and liners, is also key to getting high capture rate. And you're combining that with great communications. And com communications about prevention, of course. Separately, communications about recycling. And then what to do with that material once you've collected it? Well, here we've worked very closely with the AD sector and the composting sector to drive up the AD and composting, anaerobic digestion, producing biogas and digestate that goes to land and compost you're all very familiar with. We've seen an increase uh, of 2 million tonnes food waste capacity and a tenfold increase in AD over the last eight years as a result of doing this. And then, of course, you need to work with farmers to see the benefits in taking the digestate and the compost and using that to close the loop and grow more food. And here we did three years trials on compost and digestate to demonstrate the benefits. And what you see there is not only you get benefits from the nitrogen and the phosphorus in compost and digestate, but you also see other nutrients that are in digestate and compost. And the organic matter, particularly in compost, really bring great soil benefits. And so we've used that to build the case for farmers that this is a great product to take to grow more food. So, that was a gallop through what we do in this space. Just draw some key conclusions from this. I hope I've persuaded you that tackling food waste has got to be one of the key things we all do. Reducing it has got to be fundamental. And it's a huge opportunity in terms of reducing costs and also reducing our impact on the environment and helping us feed the world population going forward. There's a very clear business case. There's also a very clear social and environmental case. And this, taking the systematic approach, I think, is key to driving change. I think household prevention is key, but also recycling is a great way of closing the loop and also making the best use of every scrap of food that we produce on the planet. Critically, I think we've got to act, and we've got to act now, we've got to act together, we've got to act in collaboration. We've got to unite in the food waste fight. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen.